Aloha and welcome to Holistic Wellness Revealed. I'm Letitia Sharp and I'm here today to talk to you about harm versus hurt. I am delighted to have Dr. Peter Polsky, owner and founder of Catalyst Health and Wellness Center and a yoga therapist and yoga instructor as our guest today. Uh, welcome, Peter, Dr. Peter. How are you today? I'm so great. Thanks for having me here, Tish. It's great to see you again. Oh, it's great to have you on the show. And uh, on just a side note uh, to all of our viewers of how much me personally, and one thing that I love about how you do this is that you allow me personally as a patient of yours to really find my way to my healing. And this subject of harm versus hurt and hurt versus harm has come up in our sessions. And I'd really like to kind of delve a little deeper into that. Can um, you start by introducing how you feel about that? Yeah, um, I so uh, thank you for picking this topic in particular for today, um, because it kind of it came up in one of our sessions. Uh, you know, we worked together a handful of times, and uh, I was, you know, we're always looking at the big picture, right? It's like, a, you know, we're we're three layers as human beings: we're bodies, we're minds, and we're spirits, right? To me, that's the real trinity. And um, so, whatever comes up in our you know, our, our half hour or hour sessions uh, in terms of the way we look at things and, and perspective, the vantage point of perspective. I never know, you know, how it's going to go. It's a little bit like swimming through the through the surf or, or navigating the tide. So um, so we were talking about headspace a little bit. And uh, one of the things that, that we get wrapped up in, and me as a physician, right, I, I technically I have to give everyone a diagnosis. But I'm always, I always struggle to diagnose, you know, neuropathy or, or vertigo, right? Because we become so attached to labels, right? Language is useful in that specificity, but it, it kind of becomes reductionist in something that we cling to as a definition that maybe does or doesn't apply to us. Certainly things apply to us in the now, but the only constant in life is change. And so the idea of hurt versus harm kind of came up just after reviewing uh, the the rehabilitation Bible, if you will, right? The Liebenson book. And in the beginning of it, it talks about how important it is to sort of lead people to recognizing the temporary nature of all of our circumstances, right? Because, um, you know, we're born and none of us are getting out of here alive. So everything by definition of that is temporary as far as we understand it in this manifest universe. So the idea of hurt versus harm, there's lots of ways to look at it. But for me, it kind of came from years of life. I used to play gay rugby, right? And um, on a rugby team, everybody's hurt the whole time, right? Like every time you have a match, you're banged up, you're beat up, you're stepped on, you're hurt after every match. But sometimes people are injured, right? So the idea of hurt versus harm in our mindset is so important to the healing process. So, okay, so let's take that even another layer deeper. And what came out to me when I was feeling into this is what the harm actually can come from are these stories that we make up about the hurt. Um, and do you, do you agree with that? Oh, 100%, 100%. You know, there's... um. The way research is done in our, our Western society, it's it's based on where the dollars and cents lie. So um, so we have these sort of anecdotal, experiential sort of clouds of understanding. But then we look at what the gold standard is in terms of how research dollars are spent. And, and there's a there's a direct disconnect between what we're able to observe in terms of where the funding lies and what we see a lot of times in real life, right? How do we test something so complex as the way our attitudes or our mindsets affects the physiological function of our body? And how does that relate specifically to the process of healing? So that's the whole interplay between somatics, right? The idea of all of these different science disciplines being sort of isolated little chunks like psychology, 
is different from neurobiology, is different from immunology. But what is the interplay of like the hormonal system that would be endocrinology? And how do all of those interlink, right? The idea of what we might call like psycho neuroimmunology, right? How does your immune system relate, which is the healing process, right? Your immune system is, the, is essentially the way you heal in living form. How does the mindset relate to that healing process? And because it's something so complex and because there's no obvious money in it from like a pharmaceutical basis, it doesn't get researched properly. And then really, how do we go about researching it? So that's the whole... That's the whole human conundrum in a nutshell. Okay, so for our viewers and the people who have joined us today, like how would you suggest that maybe they break that down? Like how would they break down these stories that they um, are basically made up and finding a way for them to be able to really feel into what they can gain from maybe a hurt so that it doesn't turn into a harm? That's a, re that's a really big question. And that's, you know, I've been doing this work for 14 years and I am still exploring what are the, what are the ways, right? What are the useful techniques that we can, that we can apply? Um, and in general, uh, I think there's a, kind of like the exercise that we do as we begin to ground ourselves and become aware. It's like my teacher, Indu Aurora says, uh, with regards to meditation, with regards to mindfulness, she says, you know, you must first collect yourself from the cosmos, right? So, so the big picture is recognizing your place in all things, right? So, uh, noticing everything that does exist across the vastness of all things. And all of the smallness that can exist within the single dimensional point of our hearts, there's a there's an accordion, right? There's a there's a life is a box maneuvering that we can do there. So I think uh, philosophically and 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 practically, mindfulness practice is is the single biggest thing, right? Being able to turn off the thinking mind, right? The narratives that we tell ourselves are become our strongest attachments, right? Um, so the power of, you know, the present moment and being able to check into where you are now, not where you came from. I mean, certainly the present is evolving from the past, but also the future, right? Recognizing that the future that will come, it's not here. And regardless of what happens, it's going to happen. So being truly present now and recognizing all the gifts that you have and all of the challenges that you've had, right? They... These challenges, whether it be, you know, a terrible vertigo or in my case, like a, a terrifying cancer, right? Whatever, whatever we experience in our lives, that the whole story, everything happens for a reason. I think that's reductionistic kind of a cop out. But what I do firmly believe is true. And if you can apply this to your life and your experience is that everything offers us a lesson. So do you need to slow down? Do you need to become more mindful? What are the things we can do? And I think at Catalyst, one of the, the biggest sort of overarching themes that we have is that we in human society have separated ourselves from the rest of the animal world, right? We give ourselves this dominion title and we act like we're not part of the earth, that we're not part of the cosmos. And so to me, that separation is the original downfall. That's really where we went awry. So going back to mother nature, being present in nature, to whatever end you're able is, I think, the first step. Okay, wow, that was um, that was a lot. So many things came up for me while you were talking. One was um, this idea of this precious present uh, time that we're in, and the it it amazes me because I pulled out a book like I right before the show. I went and I picked out a book. That I was like, you know what, this is going to be pertinent to what we're talking about. And it's called The Precious Presence. And it's by Spencer Johnson, MD. And he talks and I opened it up to, kid you not, to this page. It says, when I feel guilty over my imperfect past or I'm anxious over my unknown future, I do not live in the present. I experience pain. I make myself ill and I am unhappy. And so I just found it amazing that, of course, you brought that to the conversation because this is how the hurt 
I mean, how the harm happens from the hurt. And if we can bring ourselves through mindfulness and through our connection with nature um, and how we are just a part of this whole that makes up the collective of all of us, then we can maybe distinguish or discern between what is an experience and what is the learning of the experience. Yeah, that's a hundred percent true. I think there's there's lots of topics on it. There's lots of great books about that. I mean, there's so many ideas that you that I could spiral off of here from what you just said in terms of like that book, The Four Agreements, right? Or the work that Joe Dispenza does, right? Just recognizing that we tether ourselves to a narrative and that narrative becomes deleterious to our our ability to experience, right? So the things that you recall in your memory, they happened in a certain way, but that is inherently based on your internal biases, which are handed down to you from people in our lives, which are handed to us from the crap society says, which are applicable to you know, kind of the moment that we're trapped in, but if we have the capacity to open our minds, be truly present now and, and conscious of the gift that the presence now is that if we can work that process by stopping and shutting down the thinking mind, right? Yoga is the cessation of the fluctuations of your mind. So that thinking piece of us, it's a small piece of who we are. If we can connect to the truth, which is that the internal universe is equally as expansive as the external universe. So, right, so all of the cosmos, trillions of galaxies in a potentially infinite universe, there's balance in all things. There is yin and yang. If the external is infinite, by definition, the internal has to be infinite. If we're not doing some work to truly go internal, and your thinking mind is not internal. Your thinking mind is based off of what the external says about whatever you are, right? So... That's more external stuff. Your thinking mind is not who you are. If we don't do work to transcend deeper than that, then we're limiting ourselves to 50% of all that infinity rather than the 100% that is external and internal. And that's just where depression comes by tethering ourselves to the past. And that's where anxiety comes by, oh, am I never going to get better? Is this a permanent? I mean, I see that so often with people who come in and they're like, Oh, I think I have a broken foot. I think I have a stress fracture. I think they come in. I'm like, you just have a muscle strain, sweetheart. And uh, this is very temporary. Let's work on the muscles. Let's let's talk about what's contributing to this. And let's let go of the idea of this being something worse than it is, or certainly something that's permanent, right? Nothing's, nothing's permanent. You have now. We really don't have much else. I think for me, the... And I, I, I think it, it's, it's, it can be hard to hear this since, and sometimes I really struggle to find creative ways to say it. But the truth is that we, our agency is extremely limited, right? We can make choices in our lives. You can choose to order the, the egg salad sandwich and you might get tuna, right? And whatever your choice was is great. There's some choice, but the only thing you really have agency over or control over is our attitude. It's the way that we respond to what the universe is handing us. That's where your only power lies. I think that's a tremendously liberating thing for some to hear. And I think it's uh, a potentially, you know, sort of, it can, it can create some shutdown or some resistance in people who aren't ready to hear that. So there's always this, um, this internal navigation that we have to explore as, as, as healers, and we're all healers, you're a human being, you've grown, you've lived, you haven't, you haven't gotten here by not healing. To whatever end you're able to heal, that's in your attitude. Mm, I love that. To whatever end you are able to heal is in your attitude. And that Where really, yeah, that's great. I love that. That's a quote right there. Boom. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks, Doc. Um, you know, I love that you brought up this is temporary because I know that at one point, I mean, I've been experiencing a certain experience in my body for so long. And at one point in our time together, you said, you know, this is temporary, right? Like This isn't forever. And it was so refreshing for me to hear because I am at a point where I am loving and seeing 
in my mind, in my body, in my spirit, what that experience has gifted me and how I'm able to lovingly release it and having the ability to work with somebody who believes that that's also possible and not getting caught up in my belief of the permanence of something that has impermanence is just, it's such a gift. Um, how does, how does that apply? I like to get real vulnerable with people on the show. And you mentioned that you had an experience with um cancer and the way you described it was terrifying is there uh anything that this subject today can relate to that experience for you and how did you like find your way to the impermanence of the cancer yeah um yeah, that's definitely a, a personal and vulnerable story, but I, I tell it uh, freely because sharing it, right, is a, it's the way forward, right? We, the, and even the name Catalyst, it comes from the idea that we're all just reflections so we can, we can learn from one another's experiences. And so when someone has a, a, a great experience or a less than great one, sharing that, that, so that we can garner perspective from one another is how we get forward as a species, as, as homo sapiens, right? We have this ability to share knowledge and that's what separates us to some end from our animal sisters and brothers. In regards to my story, um, you know, as a queer individual growing up in the Midwest in the 1980s, it was a different place. It was a different era. And I, you know, I came out this sassy little queen and everybody in my family and everyone around me, they were trying to protect me from myself, I guess, from who I was, right? Like telling me to talk this way or behave this way or don't play with Barbies, right? I, whatever. And, uh, and so with that came lots of shame, internalized shame and, and very frankly speaking, internalized homophobia that took me a very long time to sort of make peace with. Uh, so, you know, all that, that process over my young adulthood and learning about the human body and learning about the mind and discovering the yogic path in that process, all of those things sort of led me to a place where I felt like I was starting to get it, right? I was starting to recognize my patterns and my negative thought processes. I was starting to recognize how I could become my most authentic self and in that process of finding my true voice my true authenticity that that would be my ultimate path forward to be useful to the universe at large by going inwards right so i had made peace with it uh in a on a on a spiritual level on a mental level and i think on a physical level and i thought i was doing pretty well until i uh had just turned 36 uh and and then uh, I found a mass in my right testicle, my right, my right gonad. And in Vedic theory, the right is the masculine and the left is the feminine. Whether we're talking about testes or ovaries, there's balance, right? So we have a masculine and a feminine side. And Shoshona is the line of energy along where the chakras go. So each time Ida and Pingala intertwine, it's a different chakra. You know, I have, I have, I think in that time frame in my life, I was unbalanced. And then one day I discovered this mass and I instantly knew that I had cancer, right? My training taught me about what to know and what to look for. And so, uh, you know, four days later, I had an ultrasound. And before I even made it home from the ultrasound, my doctor was on the phone telling me you have cancer. And so that was terrifying. That was an existential crisis, you know. I knew, knowing what I know, that it was early in the disease process. Um, but I think I'm a very, like, big picture why person. And so for me, I was like, why, right? Why, why, why did this happen? Why, how did this happen? I mean, the, you know, with cancers, there are many, 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 all things in the human body, right? There's no such thing as a single variable, but what were the, what were the circumstances that led to this happening in my body? And like I said earlier, I think attitude is everything, right? And so I, I really was like, okay, yeah, you may have some genetic factors and maybe some lifestyle factors. You know, you kept your cell phone in your right front pocket for 20 years while you were 
waiting tables and bartending and sitting in lecture, like that's a factor, right? All these, and I will take that one to my grave. My urologist laughed at me when I said that, you know, the ionizing radiation in my, in my pocket was related to the right. I mean, I also had skin cancer in that same spot. So there's, that's a factor, right? But all of these, all of these layers and factors at my mind had to be the biggest one because that's my truth, right? That's the way I understand it. And so I really like, I meditated, I cried, I, um, I worried, I, I tried to break it down and tried to understand. And after about, you know, seven days, 10 days, uh, you know, just looking at what the medical tests had shown, the only tumor marker that I had elevated was beta HCG, human chorionic gonadotropin, you know, and that's, um, that's the hormone that we look for in women that determines pregnancy, right? So. So here I was, this sassy little queen with lots of shame and internalized homophobia. And I somehow my mind and my environment and my genetics conspired to turn my right testicle into my placenta. But what are the odds, right? So uh so I I sort of realized it just kind of hit me like a ton of bricks, right? Trying to act macho or behave in a masculine way or trying to change my voice, like the actual pitch and timbre of my voice to match what the external world had said was incongruent with my internal truth. And that lack of authenticity was, was my Achilles heel. And so, uh, so that realization led me to the way out, the way forward. And I, um, uh, I said a little, I said, a, you know, I'm, I'm a very spiritually minded person and also a very secular human, I, but I recognize that the divine exists in all of us and we are reflections of it and we are part of it. And so I had to make peace with the divine part of myself that was at odds with the greater divine. And I recognized that it was my admonishment or my unwillingness to accept my own feminine energy, right? That had led me to this place. And now I was pregnant with my own DNA. <laughs> kind of wild, right? So, uh, uh, I, I had help from a dear friend who, oh, I miss much. Uh, she, she was, a an acupuncture practitioner who I worked with, uh, uh, a hospital system in the twin cities where I was from at the time. And, you know, a lovely sort of pagan, wicked, lovely, beautiful genius. And she, she held my hair back and we did the ritual. We said some things and, um, I got a direct immediate, immediate sign from the universe that I was going to be okay. So by recognizing where I needed to grow, what I needed to do to change, to be the truest version of myself, the cancer became a gift. So that's the free framing that we can all look at. We can, we can, we can look at our, our hurt as uh, an opportunity to learn and to grow and to truly heal from it. Or we can look at it as a harm and I could have walked around and been, you know, a cancer patient for the rest of my life, but instead I'm a divine feminist. <laughs> and I mean, there's a couple of things. First of all, thank you so much for your vulnerability and your authenticity and just the raw honesty that you were able to share because I agree with you that sharing those vulnerabilities of humanness and our growth is what keeps us keeps our ability to be connected to each other but there are a couple things and it goes back to your saying healing happens in our attitude and I do, that's not a direct quote <laughs> is that you didn't say when you asked why you didn't say why me you said why I said, why me first? I definitely, I, I definitely said, why me? If there was a why me that happened, that was my initial. I remember, you know, I just got off the phone and I remember curling up on my couch, bawling in a fetal position saying, why friggin' me? Why is this happening in my life? And I, and that's an okay part of the process, right? I think recognizing that why me, but also recognizing that you are not a big deal. I am not a big deal. It is the we that makes all of this work. So how can I leverage this why me moment into uh, uh, a what about us maybe is how I, how I chose to look at it. Yeah. But yeah, why me? There's nothing wrong with why me. Why? It's like the stages of grief or the stages of loss. 
You have to go through all of those phases, right? And you cannot judge yourself for going through that because that's just part of the human process. So having the patience for yourself that we oftentimes extend to others is key to that. And I think that is, a for, my, for me, that was another huge part of the healing process. Yeah. So why me? Go with it. Run with it. Do it. Eat the, eat the expensive desserts, drink the, whatever you're going to drink, like, like talk about it, work through it, let it out. And then recognize that the narrative of the process isn't actually the whole picture. You're just a small piece of it. And you get to be the conduit for which this can reflect to a greater good. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Sorry to interrupt you. <laughs> no, that was perfect. That was, it was perfect because. You know, I actually got out of, I got into my judgmental self of judging my own self for sometimes going into that part of the process. And it's a beautiful reminder to be able to love every single part of the process because that is how we allow that pain to just be pain. And it's not suffering, right? Suffering is what we attach all these stories to. And and the harm is what we attach all the stories to. But if we do choose to be, um, and I'm just going to summarize this, if we choose to find our way into nature, if we, use, if we choose to see ourselves as a part of the whole, if we choose to see those hurts as gifts, and also allowing ourselves to find the attitude that is healing, then we will find our happy. We will find our health. We will find our um, we will find our holistic wellness. So uh, I'm so grateful to have you on. Is there anything that I missed that you would like to add to that for people watching, just to kind of give them a little. Yeah, I think it's a great, I think it's a pretty comprehensive list. And apparently it's so does Bones. She decided she wanted to make a cameo here. <laughs> She's the baby kitten. She she wants you to all know she agrees with Tish. Um, <laughs> yeah, so that, what you just said, is is pretty comprehensive. I think it's important to really view it in terms of a framework because our lives are a framework, right? The first thing we do when we're born, this is a quote from my teacher, Indu, again, the first thing we do is we inhale. The last thing we do is we exhale. And there's a finite number of breaths between that breath in and that breath out, right? You don't know what it's going to be. But what you do have is the ability to appreciate the current moment with, a, with a, an awareness and a reflectivity of everything that exists, ever has existed, ever will exist. It's all one single thing. And the illusion of our, our, our aloneness is exactly that, right? So... There are infinite tethers that we are not able to experience because of the limitations of our senses, right? So our five senses, right? They're so narrow. You hear in a range, you see in a wavelength, right? You feel in terms of the nerve endings that are present in your limited human form. So much of the universe that we know exists because of scientific instrumentation is unavailable to us. And the interdimensionality of all things is unavailable to us unless we transcend our thinking narrative mind and experience the inward for real in our lives. And so the healing process simply comes from going inwards and having patience for your human experience and being not attached to an outcome and not judging yourself or others. And that's, to me, I think that reframe and where we're able to find a way forward regardless of our circumstance. Yes. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much, Peter for um, coming on, Dr. Peter, to help us to understand all of the ins and outs and wholeness of this and get out of our stinking thinking and into, you know, our knowing, our knowing of who we are individually and who we are together with this planet and each other and the existence of all. So, um, thank you. Thank you. Well said. <laughs> I would um I would highly encourage and recommend that if anybody is looking for that extra level of healing with on um, their chiropractic care or even with just working through things that may need to be moved and lifted up, I would highly, highly suggest and invite you to contact Dr. Peter at 
Catalyst Health and Wellness Center. Um, thanks again. And thank you so much to ThinkTech Kauai for offering this platform for us to be able to have these conversations, these conversations that can be brought to all of us as a whole and to help to further our awareness of ourselves and how we can be holistic and well. Mahalo. Mahalo. to announce that ThinkTech Hawaii is moving into a new phase and will not be producing regular talk shows after April 30th. We will retain our website and YouTube channel and will accept new content on an ad hoc basis. We are also developing a legacy archive program to provide continuing public access to our content. If you can help us cover the costs of the transition and the development of our legacy archive program, please make a donation on thinktechaway.com. Thanks so much. Aloha.